Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W. We're continuing our discussion of the Depression era and popular culture during the Great Depression. And in this final lecture, we're going to talk more about sports in the Depression years, and in this case, look at the New Deal and its influence in the realm of sport, and also the advent of mass participation in sports in America. FDR's New Deal programs helped strengthen American interest in sport and laid the foundation for the sports craze of the late 20th century. The WPA and other relief agencies devoted much money and manpower to the construction of sporting facilities such as gymnasiums, swimming pools, and tennis courts. The federal government aided in municipal landscaping projects and the building of parks and playgrounds and encouraged citizens to play and exercise. Civic programs, church groups, youth clubs, the YMCA, and many local organizations grew in support of sports. New Deal projects involving the creation of ski trails and the promotion of winter sports led to a boom in the skiing industry. Between 1930 and 1940, the number of skiers in the United States grew from just a few thousand to some two million. Horse racing enjoyed a revival in the late 30s fueled in part by the abundance of new or remodeled tracks built with federal aid. The government sponsored the growth of public sporting grounds, golf courses, tennis and basketball courts, and baseball and softball fields. Sports such as golf and tennis moved from the realm of the elite to the public domain as a result of these programs. Americans in the Great Depression also craved heroes, and the favorite heroes were those who came from nothing and rose to success. Stories like Cinderella Man, James J. Braddock, who saw his boxing career wrecked in the early years of the Depression to rise up and win the heavyweight championship. And Seabiscuit, the little horse that could, who made a fantastic story as owner, rider, trainer, and horse all saw their careers on the skids before he rose to success in the mid to late 1930s. Raced heavily in his early career, by 1933, Seabiscuit was washed up, thrown to the scrap heap. In 1936, he was bought by the automobile entrepreneur Charles Howard, who brought in a new trainer, Tom Smith, and a new jockey, Red Pollard. He began winning again in late 1936 and engaged in a fierce rivalry with War Admiral, a huge classic thoroughbred descended from multiple Triple Crown winners. Forty million Americans listened to their match race on November 1, 1938, which Seabiscuit won. Incidentally, both of these unlikely sports heroes were featured in films within the last decade or so, Cinderella Man and Seabiscuit, so something about their stories is compelling to Americans even now, many decades later. Not all Americans responded positively to FDR and the New Deal. As we've discussed in previous lectures, there was uh, a vast anti-New Deal movement around the country. The decade was marred by labor strife, strikes, and violence as downtrodden workers struggled to escape the Depression. Worker unrest spilled over into the world of sports, a sporting movement within the working class which flourished in Europe took root in many urban areas in America. Many workers who were first or second generation immigrants preferred to play the sports of their native countries to American baseball or football. International worker sports groups included the Socialist Workers Sport International and its communist rival, the Red Sport International. Both groups emphasized mass participation, group discipline, and physical fitness over competition and profits. Their athletic festivals featured swimming, cycling, soccer, running, and gymnastics. They opposed the cutthroat competition and selfish exploitation of professional athletics, and on a number of occasions they held alternative sporting festivals. While these international groups stage huge events in Europe and Russia, labor sports groups in the United States held smaller alternative Olympiads in both 1932 and 1936. The 1932 Alternative Games were held in Chicago, and in 1936, Counter-Olympics were held in both Cleveland and New York City. 
While similar festivals in Europe attracted hundreds of thousands of spectators, those in America struggled to draw several thousand. This failure might be attributed to the general aversion to communism and socialism in the United States, and the popularity of sports like baseball, which attracted many immigrant participants. Still, this nascent worker sport movement, ultimately undone by the American nationalism of World War II, did provide an alternative sporting venue for the worker of the Depression era. Sport in America during the Great Depression bridged a gap between the golden age of sports of the 1920s and the post-war boom of the late 1940s. Owners and managers longed for the huge crowds and gate receipts of the 20s, and fans looked in vain for athletic heroes in the towering tradition of Babe Ruth and Red Grange. Still, the 1930s looked forward more than back. Black athletes competed against and bested white athletes with greater frequency, and anticipated the successful integration of major sports which would follow in the 1940s. Female athletes, led by Babe Diedrichsen, achieved greatness on the athletic fields, at the same time inspiring talk of sexual ambiguity and lesbianism which would plague female athletics even in the late 20th century. Perhaps most important, in the 1930s, fewer people watched sporting events and more people participated. Aided by funding from New Deal programs, sports such as golf, tennis, skiing, bowling, and others attracted millions of Americans. This mass participation in sports presaged the fitness craze of the 80s and 90s. The Great Depression challenged athletes, coaches, and owners with poor attendance and reduced salaries and threatened them with destitution themselves. In adapting to survive these troubled times, they laid the foundation for trends in athletics that would reach prominence in the post-war era.